in the interest of time, we're going to roll straight into the next speaker. That'll be Brian Esparo. Uh, Brian is the COO of an organization called Carbon Quest. Without further ado, we'll turn it over to him and roll on. Great. Thank you, Nick. And thanks to Peter Pissarro and the team for having me. As, Mick, as Nick mentioned, I'm Brian Esparo, the Chief Operating Officer for Carbon Quest, based in New York City. Um, so as, as Greg just pointed out, the, the urban heating is, is, is also real and felt here. But um, when Peter and I discussed the topic for this summit, decarbonization for urban building owners, I thought about what aspects to cover, and two really came to mind, market and technology. And so in, the rough, in roughly the next 10 minutes or so, I'm hoping to cover both of these topics, as well as weave in some high level thoughts around investment opportunities, and perhaps a bit about what we're trying to do here at Carbon Quest. And so in summary, we believe that decarbonizing buildings is a large and growing market. Um, too few building owners have decarbonization plans today uh, with robust data, but we do think that's likely to change. There's likely a multi-technology or solution approach to succeed to significantly reduce emissions from a diverse building stock. And corporate and project finance opportunities will grow at scale, but perhaps new types of funding approaches will need to be considered. First, a little bit about Carbon Quest. Uh, our focus is to help building owners decarbonize buildings now through technologies and solutions. What are the unique aspects of what we do is what we call distributed carbon capture and providing uh, decarbonization through distributed carbon capture in buildings. Uh, as you'd imagine, it's not been uh, done um, across the, the, the broader landscape, so it's relatively new and, and unique, but we'll discuss a little bit more about that in a bit. Let's start with the market for decarbonizing buildings, which we believe is large and growing. We already know that the broader market for renewable energy and ESG investment is significant. You know, according to BlackRock, $288 billion was invested by mutual funds and ETFs and sustainable assets in 2020. It's likely there's different aspects to this size in, in many cases, but at least it's a reference point. Uh, that was up almost 100% from 2019. But when you compare that to mo a multi-trillion dollar energy industry, there's still lots of room to grow. I think everybody on this panel and summit uh, are here for that express reason. Uh, you know, a good portion of that sustainable asset funding is focused either directly or indirectly to reduce economy-wide the roughly 5 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide annually emitted by the United States or in the United States. Well, you know, the building sector accounts for roughly 2 billion metric tons annually, or roughly 40% of that total. That mostly covers areas like electricity generation, natural gas, oil, steam, waste. Interestingly, however, buildings account for a significantly higher emission percentage in cities uh, than the 40% carbon uh, emissions economy wide. So cities will account for anywhere from 50 to 80% of carbon emissions in, in cities. In cities like New York, where we live, um, buildings account for 67% of cities, the city's total emissions. In places like St. Louis, it's estimated to be as high as 80%. At the same time, you know, according to C40, over 225 global cities have announced greenhouse gas or carbon reduction targets, many with these targets as early as 2025 or 2030. So it seems hard to, for building owners to ignore this equation. How are building owners being brought into this equation? Well, absent a, in the United States, a federal or state-led carbon tax or incentives to reduce emissions, cities are working towards carbon emission reduction programs. Three seem to appear to be rising to the top. One is a cap and trade or cap and invest program, which is being employed in cities like Tokyo and being discussed in Washington state. Two, uh, energy efficiency standard programs, mostly focused on electricity and renewable energy in cities like Washington, DC. And three, carbon penalty programs focus specifically on carbon emission reduction in places like New York City. And so for us, we find the carbon penalty program called Local Law 97 in New York City quite interesting. With New York targeted to reduce emissions 40% from 2005 levels by 2030 and 80% by 2050, 
the approach to specifically target carbon emissions seems like a wise one. Unlike other programs, Local Law 97 focuses on carbon emissions from consumption of all sources, electricity, natural gas, oil, steam. And a little bit about the program, it focuses on buildings above 25,000 square feet, of which there are an estimated 50,000 out of a total 1.1 million building stock. Now that may seem relatively small percentage, but that 50,000 buildings accounts for almost 40% of all emissions in the city. Local Law 97 kicks off in 2024 and runs through at least 2035. Each building is allotted a certain amount of carbon that it can emit annually, which varies by square foot and building type, whether you're a hotel or a multifamily property or a commercial office building. If a building were to emit more than the allotment or limit, the building is penalized or charged at $268 per metric ton above that limit, which we believe is the highest price on carbon that we've seen. Rough estimates are the collective penalties will total up to $4 billion per year starting in 2024 and rise to as much as 20 billion in 2030 if building owners do not invest in technologies and solutions. Urban Green Council, a group based out of New York, estimates that the retrofit market related to Local Law 97 in New York alone is at least 20 billion through 2030. So you can imagine this has the real estate industry paying close attention. Many building owners are moving, others are not yet convinced, some are waiting, it kind of runs the gamut. But it does appear that with the scale of building decarbonization programs like Local Law 97, in combination with 225 global cities adopting reduction targets, Perhaps this is the scale that will bring more capital and technology into this space. But what types of technologies and solutions are being adopted by building owners to reduce emissions? Well, there appears to be a few technologies and solutions emerging for building owners to adopt to reduce emissions. But first, recently Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, stated in a letter to corporate CEOs that they need to start coming up with a climate plan. He stated that climate risk is investment risk. But at the same time, this climate transition presents a historic investment opportunity. We believe the same is true for building owners. One of the big challenges that's been discussed on this panel so far is the lack of data. And it is true, we struggle to reduce or improve what we cannot measure. However, there's lots of work being done on policy to track building emissions by, on a building by buildings basis with what are called benchmarking laws. And there are several companies like Hatch Data and Interdiv we're tracking data on many energy related aspects of a building. We believe that this area will continue to grow. Think about buildings have effectively been a one way flow of communications, primarily for build billing purposes uh, to date. This will certainly change. And we believe we will start to see more real time carbon tracking for building owners to make decisions. As it relates to technologies and solutions building owners are or will adopt, we believe there's a basket of several options that will emerge and that are currently available. We have a diverse building stock and geographies in the US from single family to multifamily, commercial, industrial, and warm climates to cold climates. And so there's a, a, not a one size fits all approach to this. There are a few categories are emerging for what building owners can do. I, I do like what Greg just mentioned is one way to reduce carbon emissions is to stop doing stupid things. And, and that, that makes sense. And there is a role that government is playing or can play uh, whether it's city or state or federal to move the needle on a lot of this work with decarbonization of buildings. But for building owners specifically, there's really two main ways. One is offsite reduction, which encompasses the overall greening of the electricity grid through renewables or things like renewable natural gas. Also, this includes carbon offsets or carbon credits from sources like com community solar, wind, planting trees. The other is on-site reduction. So what can building owners do specifically for their buildings. Things like energy efficiency, on-site solar, on-site storage, in some cases, fuel cells, whether they're hydrogen or natural gas, conversion of existing assets to low carbon, full building electrification, that appears to be the holy grail in many cases for decarbonization. We like to enter another option into the equation, which is what we've been working on, uh, carbon capture, and we'll explain that in a minute. You know, these technologies are available today. In many cases, costs are dropping as scale hits the market. The challenge in some cases is for building owners to build a plan for decarbonization. So what are we doing at Carbon Quest to help building owners decarbonize? We've built a platform which we call CMS or Carbon Management System. 
whereby we can track carbon emissions on a real-time basis in buildings. In addition, we provide energy efficiency, which acts at, like an optimized building management system to improve efficiency of electrical infrastructure, as well as improve efficiency of other assets, such as boilers. That's sort of the first line of defense as we see it. We've also developed an approach to perform carbon capture in buildings. And the story goes, when we first started talking with building owners about what they were looking for in terms of technologies and solutions to reduce emissions, a few things came to the top of the list. Something that's economical, something that doesn't cause a major disruption to their facility, something that could measure that reduction, and something that can potentially provide local community benefits, whether that's local pollution reduction, jobs, equity and fairness. And so um, we thought about that. We researched and found a significant number of buildings in cities like New York utilizing natural gas for heating, hot water, and absorptive chilling. And for many of these buildings, natural gas usage was as much as 40% or more of their carbon emissions. So we thought maybe we could shrink the concept of carbon capture, typically done at a power generation facility or gas facility, to a building footprint. Not that different from, say, large-scale solar to rooftop solar. We found that there were existing techniques and technologies that were utilized across the roughly 30 carbon capture projects globally, which reduce a collective 40 million tons per year, which coincidentally is very close to the amount of emissions that New York City emits per year. So we developed and patented this approach to perform carbon capture in a building and worked with a large multifamily property owner to give it a chance. We're completing that first project that, um, in, in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And this customer is interested to expand significantly to other buildings and the pipeline and interest, interest is growing. It seems to solve a problem. How does it work? We employ a four-step process to take flue gas coming off of boil, building's boilers to first, condense the gas. Second, separate and purify the CO2. Third, liquefy the CO2. And fourth, transport the CO2 to an off-taker for sequestration. And what that does is close the carbon emission reduction solution, hopefully, furthering the carbon, the circular carbon economy. We sell that CO2 to two main sectors at the moment, concrete manufacturing and wastewater treatment. However, there are many existing and growing sectors that further to explore, specifically a lot of effort and, and um, research going into carbon to value. What makes the technology attractive is that it's based on the existing local law 97 structure, we see an initial attractive payback of four to six years or a rough eight to 10% post-tax IRR. And we believe with scale, performance will increase and costs will decrease. There's a ready-made market of at least 18,000 buildings in New York City uh, of a potential market of 6 billion alone. And so another attractive aspect is carbon capture can cover a significant portion of a building's emissions. All that is great. However, one of the challenges for tackling this challenge will, is how will building owners engage? And so for those without capital, there are options like leasing, power purchase, and energy service agreements. The problem is that these types of programs are not specifically designed to reduce carbon emissions. We do think it is possible for new ways of finance, perhaps things like decarbonization as a service, to emerge. Ultimately, this is one option that we think will be added, which is carbon capture to the technology mix. And so we think that in summary, decarbonizing buildings is a very large market. Few building, owner, building owners need to start to develop plans. Technologies are available and will develop and new and, and existing ways of financing these types of approaches will emerge. So that's it for me. Thank you. And back to you, Nick. Brian, fantastic. I love it. Uh, we've got about four minutes left. Um, Throw out a quick question here. I love what you guys are doing. Carbon capture technology is fascinating. It's clearly part of the solution. Um, it has a reputation for being expensive. You know, why wouldn't it be a lot cheaper for a building owner to just go buy some offsets from a forestry project in Brazil and call it a day on, on their carbon footprint? It's certainly possible. And that's an option, as you know, mentioned in terms of offsets. Um, However, as it relates specifically to New York City um, and how Local Law 97 is designed, uh, offsets are only allowable if the offsets are being delivered into New York City. Mm -hmm. 
And the idea behind that is to create local uh, pollution improvement, as well as jobs and, um, you know, things more on the local sense. And so um, the, the competitive nature of carbon capture or other things like solar energy efficiency uh, way out, we think, for many building owners to try to do things locally. But certainly it is a, a, you know, a full basket approach with offsets as part of this as well. Interesting. Um, the localized the, the laws such as Local Law 97, um, how much of the success of what you're doing then kind of depends on and having that regulation? And to wrap it up, do you expect to see that type of regulation, that type of law uh, popping up at the state level, popping up elsewhere in the country, et cetera, so that you know, folks like you could take advantage of that? It seems as if, you know, if, we, if, the, if the numbers are correct, buildings are a big part of the equation, not the only part, but a big part of it. And cities, someone mentioned earlier, cities are taking a, a, a leadership in developing programs to either incent or uh, force building owners to comply. And so, you know, programs like Local Law 97, we see are being discussed in other cities. There's a group called the Institute for Market Transformation that's doing a lot of work in and around this space. What generally starts first with these types of programs is to do benchmarking so that data could be collected on all these buildings. It's exactly what New York did. It's called Local Law 84. Other, other cities are doing this now globally. And if you remember, there's 225 cities that have reduction targets. And so it seems as if other cities are going to adopt similar programs. It may not be exactly the same. All cities are different. But we do think that they're going to be adopted at which point building owners do need a plan right? um, and, and, and to give a, a sense for what they need and want to do in order to comply. So we think that there's a huge market opportunity in this space that will emerge you know, over the next 30 years with trying to, you know, a lot of targets towards 2050. It's, yeah. it's, it's a long ways to go and we have to do it quickly. Yeah. Uh, one more question just popped in and then we'll, then we'll wrap it up for that. This is from Edward Shaw. Um, what have been the challenges in getting buildings on board? Has this been an easy sell or are you still uh, finding it difficult to, to lay the case for what you're doing? It's um, what we, early technology, right? It's, just, it's the same person who decided to put the first person to put rooftop solar on their roof. Mm -hmm. um, everyone else thought, well, that's, why are they doing that? That doesn't seem to make sense. Why can't I just buy it in a large power plant? Um, so it's, it's the concept of what we're trying to do, how it adds value, uh, and how it fits within an, an overall building's plan. And we think it's just early stage, um, the early stage sort of crossing the chasm, if, if you will. We're getting lots of interest about this because of its, its um, call it relative simplicity. And so the challenge has just been to do it, right? As a lot of these things are, it's easy to talk about, harder to do. And so now that we have this first project operating and we're now about to do an another set of projects here in New York, we just hope that we're able to explain where this can work well, how it can work and see how it, it gets adopted, which we think there's a, a large market opportunity for it. So it's more so in just the education and crossing the chasm that we think um, will be, it will happen hopefully and uh, can happen.